Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Angela Mills. I work for the town of Amherst. I'm one of your community participation officers, and I'm also the executive assistant to Paul Bockelman, our town manager. I want to welcome everyone here tonight. It's not quite 630, so we're going to give it just a minute and a half more before we get rolling. I did want to let everyone know that this meeting is being recorded, and we have a framework that we'll review with you, and there will be plenty of time for lots of questions and lots of answers from the experts. So welcome, everyone. We're just going to wait until 630 happens on my computer screen, and then we will get rolling. So thanks for being with us. Welcome once again to our first ever web banner. Yeah. <laughs> That's from Brianna Sunred. Um, and thanks again for being with us. Are those Amherst bears behind you? I, you know, I took them from the state website, I think. I think these are Dave's bears. It, it looked familiar. I think those are our old photographer, Bill Byrne, I think took those photos. I don't know where. You don't know where there's a bear? Well, where he took the photos. <laughs> <laughs> I have a hand a... raised over in the other room. Why, why is there We're a doing questions and answers at the end, Mary Anderson, but welcome. Thanks for being with us. Yes, thank you. The hand is on Dave, watch out. Almost there. All right, we are up to 32 attendees. I'm kind of excited. Everybody loves bears. Uh -huh. Right we now. will officially start this at 6.30. I want to welcome everyone again. It's nice of you to be with us. All things Black Bear related. Sorry. Although I did learn that Dave's an expert on all fur-bearing mammals. Yes, not only Black Bears, but coyotes, beavers, bobcats, kind of you name it, I'm, I'm responsible for as well. Nice. All right, so welcome everyone. It's officially 6.30. Thanks for being with us tonight. All things bear related here in the town of Amherst. My name is Angela Mills. I'm one of your community participation officers. I'm also Paul's executive assistant here in town hall. And tonight we're talking about bears. And this is being recorded so that we can upload it later to the YouTube channel. We have experts with us. So the framework for this evening, we'll do quick introductions. And then we will watch a presentation from Dave Waddles from the state, of, uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And then we will have time for questions and answers. So without further ado, Carol Hepburn, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I'm just, I'm the town's animal control officer. I've been here approximately probably 20 and a half years now. I grew up in South Dakota and was around many animals. The only thing that wasn't around was bears, but everything else I know, that's all I know actually is animals. I don't know much about people, uh, but um, my job here is just to here. keep peace. Excellent. Councillor Lopes, do you wanna say hello to everyone? Hi, everyone. I just want to thank Master of Ceremony, Angela Mills, and wildlife experts. Carol Hepburn or Dave Waddles, uh, Paul Bachman, who I think may have been looking forward to this even more than myself, <laughs> <laughs> and everyone else, of course, tuning in. And uh, yeah, so I have been fortunate enough to have been visited by the downtown bears. And while it was definitely one of the most amazing experiences I've ever had, and uh, my first time seeing bears in person, so it was amazing and I know that there are others that share that experience and feelings around it. I would also like to thank a group of District 4 residents who have, you know, shared their concerns and fears about, you know, walking out and having such close quartered experiences with bears, especially in regards to pets and um, young children. So, I'm really looking forward to learning best practices for interacting or not um, with all of you from the experts this evening. So thank you. Thanks for making this, helping me make this happen. And thanks for being with us tonight. Paul, did you want to say hello to everyone? 
Yeah, I thank everybody for being here, Dave and Carol. It's going to, I'm, I'm <laughs> Councillor Lopes is right. I'm really excited about this. Um, I'm going to have my camera off so I, you, everybody can focus on the, the speakers. So thanks for organizing this, Angela and Councillor Lopes. And without further ado, our guest of honor this evening, Dave. Dave, tell us a little bit about yourself and then feel free to roll right into your presentation. Okay. Uh, hi, hi, everyone. My name is Dave Waddles. I am the black bear and fur bear biologist with the Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife. Um, I've been in the position for about five and a half years now. Um, prior to that, I was a grad student and postdoc at UMass. So I'm very familiar with Amherst and the surrounding area. Uh, I got my graduate work, did my graduate work studying moose in Massachusetts. And while I was there, I began working with the, the state to put satellite tracking collars on bears that Mass Wildlife already had collared with conventional radio collars. So I worked with bears for seven or eight years before in Massachusetts before I, I came to my position here. So with that, I will get started. So I'm um, gonna start tonight by talking uh, basically about general black bear ecology um, and biology and what we know about the population here in Massachusetts and then transition into preventing conflict with bears, which ends up being probably preventing conflict with bears and these other species that I'm responsible for ends up being uh, the vast majority of my job. So just so we know what we're talking about, we're talking about black bears. That's the only bear that we have in the Eastern United States. Um, Adult males can be quite large. Um, it's pretty easy for a male to uh, be 400 pounds by four years of age. And so we definitely have many uh, male black bears that are over 450 pounds um, in Massachusetts. Adult females are considerably smaller. Um, they can range anywhere from 140 for an adult female to over 300 pounds. 300 pounds is really the extreme and would be a bear that's uh, really getting a lot of human associated foods, both bird feeders and other things, but as well as, as corn. Um, and there's also a big difference between rural and suburban bears. Uh, that 140, 160 pound female is gonna be a, a rural bear, typically in the hill towns. Um, and they're just smaller because they're pretty much reliant on only natural foods. But for a lot of the bears that we work with uh, in the collaring study I'm talking about, the, the bear that you see in the lower left here, um, 210 to 225 pounds for an adult female. Let's talk about the, the two year life cycle or breeding cycle uh, of bears. Um, this time of year in the spring is when yearlings, so one year old bears, so those, those three cubs that you've been seeing in town for the past year, uh, they disperse. So sometime in the next month or so, they're gonna disperse and they're gonna be on their own for the rest of their lives. They disperse just prior to the breeding season. So the, the breeding or mating season for bears um, start is going on now, but really peaks in June uh, and goes into July. And this is when we tend to see the, the greatest amount of bear activity. Males are covering enormous amounts of ground to try to interact with and mate with as many females as they can. Those young bears are moving around and they're on their own for the first time. So think of them as teenagers who are suddenly kicked out and going to college. Um, so lots and lots of bear activity, and we tend to see a peak in conflict uh, every year in June. So in the mating season for bears, <clears throat> when the, the egg is fertilized, it begins to develop, but then the, the pregnancy pauses. And basically it's because the egg doesn't implant in the uterus, it remains floating. And so for a period of time, there's, bears have something that's called delayed implantation. So for the rest of the summer and into the fall, that female is, um, she's impregnated and she has fertilized eggs in her, but she's not, um, the pregnancy is not developing. Um, she's alone and finding food uh, for this, this period of time. Around November 1st, and it's pretty much like clockwork, plus or minus a week every year, um, all the pregnant females enter the den. Um, something changes hormonally and physio physiologically with them. Um, and it's this time that the egg, the fertilized egg implants in the, the uterine wall and the pregnancy begins to develop. The, the fetus develops over the next couple months in the den, and then the cubs are born in the den in mid-January and early February. They're about a pound, um, their eyes are closed, they don't have much fur, and basically they're solely dependent on mom's, mom's milk for them to grow and develop over the next couple months. 
Um, so she'll nurse them. She's, she's awake quite a lot of the time um, in the den in the winter. Um, and she's nursing the cubs and they go from one pound to up to six or eight pounds by the time they're, they're leaving the den. Those pregnant females with newborn comes typically emerge around April 1st, again, plus or minus a, a week or so, and that's pretty consistent every year. For the next seven or eight months, she has those newborn cubs with her. So she is providing them milk still, but she's also introducing natural foods to them, showing them how to be bears, where to find foods, how to uh, avoid trouble, how to cross roads, um, and other things. By late summer, they're weaned, so they're no longer um, receiving milk from her. Um, and then they will enter the den sometime, typically after the pregnant females. It could be anywhere from early to mid-November into December, January, or not at, at all, as you guys saw uh, last winter uh, in Amherst. If they do den, um, the sow in those yearling cubs, one-year-old cubs den together. Um, and they tend to emerge a little bit earlier, mid-February, mid-March, um, depending on conditions. Um, and then they'll be active together as a family again for the next couple months before we hit this time of year again when they disperse and we enter the breeding season again. So that's a two-year cycle. Um, you know, so she's giving a sow is giving birth to cubs every other year, and she keeps those cubs with her for a little over a year. I'm going to talk about bear diet and habitat use. So bears are opportunistic omnivores. This means basically a bear will eat anything. Um, so they'll eat both plants and, and meat matter, um, but 99% of their, their diet is vegetarian, is plant-based. So that means in the spring that they're heavily reliant on the first emergent lust vegetation. And so this is typically around wetlands. Uh, skunk cabbage is an extremely important um, overwintering food for them, but also in the spring. But they will also take advantage of nuts, acorns, hickory nuts, beech nuts that have fell in the fall and are still available on the ground after the winter. And they will opportunistically take on, take advantage of both carrion and then deer fawns after um, they're born in the spring. But they're not chasing down prey like a bobcat would or a fisher or something. They're not that type of, uh, of a predator. This type of year, if you look around food, this time of year, food's pretty scarce. Um, there's not a lot of natural food. That vegetation isn't very nutritious. So bears are actually still losing weight at this time of year. And so we do tend to see uh, heavy use of human associated foods, bird feeders, garbage, and other foods uh, in the spring. Pretty much throughout the year, you're going to find bears where they can find food uh, seasonally as it changes. And so in spring, habitat use in natural areas tends to be uh, wetland dominated. As the season evolves and progresses, different foods become available, bears shift their diet and their habitat used to take advantage of those. So their summer diet is gonna consist of insect nests, so ant, bee, and wasp nests, the larva, grubs, the honey. They'll basically eat everything in those nests, dig them out of logs and stumps and out of the ground. Um, soft mast, so soft mast is, is berries and fruits. So they'll go right through the summer as different fruits are available. So, um, strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, blackberries, cherries, grapes, they, they'll use them all throughout the summer. And this is a really important natural food source for them. And this is where they start to go from that energy deficit to a surplus again. Unfortunately, they will also take advantage of crops, particularly corn and apples, and bears can really do quite a lot of damage in cornfields. They'll go into cornfields and they'll just kind of park there and they just flatten large areas of cornfield and, and really can cause quite a lot of damage for farmers. In the summers, we tend to find bears in upland forest, uh, logged areas. Um, logged areas are important because of the, the downed trees and, and logs. That's great places for those, those insects, the ants and wasps and bees to nest. Um, so they'll dig in the logs for those as they rot, but also the, the open forest allows uh, the berry crops to, to grow for a period of years. And so bears will concentrate in these areas, still in wetlands and then fields and orchards. As we move from late summer and into fall, bears enter a state that's called hyperphagia. This is basically a compulsion for them to start eating as much as possible, to start packing on the fat reserves that they need to survive the winter in hibernation when they won't eat at all. And so you may have seen brown bears that congregate on salmon runs and things. This is them, um, uh, where they're just gluttonous, you know, eating salmon after salmon after salmon. This is that hyperphagia. For, for our bears, we don't have that kind of salmon run or fish run, so they're relying on different foods. It can be, unfortunately, crops again, 
Um, but the big natural food is the hard mast. And so hard mast is acorns, beech nuts, and hickory nuts, with acorns and beech nuts certainly being favored over hickory nuts. And they'll definitely take advantage of deer carcasses um, from the hunting season as well. They tend to be found in upland forest fields and orchards. So when do bears hibernate? We talked about this a little bit before. Um, the pregnant females, like I said, end of October, early November is when they're going to uh, enter the den. Males in those females with one-year-old cubs, November, December, later or not at all. The variability of when these other bears enter the den is pr pretty much caused by food availability and weather. And it's not weather in terms of the cold. A bear has you know, a better winter coat than most of than the deer, the coyote, these other animals that are active all winter, plus a, a thick layer of fat. So they can deal with the cold in winter. It But snow on the ground, ice on the ground can prevent them from accessing acorns or other foods, uh, again, being vegetarian. So it's that lack of food that causes them to go to the den. If food is scarce, they tend to den earlier. There's an exception to this. If they haven't gained the fat they need to survive hibernation, then they may not then, they'll kind of try to keep eating and finding food until they, they do have enough fat to survive. So they may actually stay out later. Um, if food is scarce, if it's abundant, they'll den, den later as well, or potentially not at all if there's a rich steady food source all winter. Unfortunately, that steady food source tends to be human associated foods, bird feeders now, it, like your bears, um, we've seen this before in Amherst. Uh, we've seen it before in Northampton and other places where bears remain active all winter. And it's because bird feeders are providing basically a year round food source that wouldn't be there uh, otherwise. So it kind of precludes that need to den. When they're in the den, they're in there for four to five months and they don't eat, they don't drink and they don't excrete waste. So their metabolism really decreases, um, but they're not true hibernators. So they can wake up just like that and, and become active uh, immediately. Why do they hibernate? I started talking about this. It's to cope with that. It's an adaptation to cope with that uh, seasonal food shortage. So this means that a bear has to gain all the calories, all the fat they need to survive winter uh, in that short period that they're active. And this means that they're evolutionarily adapted to search for calorie rich foods and, and concentrated food sources. This is basically just what a bear is. Uh, and unfortunately, um, we in modern society readily pro provide these around our homes, communities, and neighborhoods. Uh, and this is what drives conflict. It's not that these are bad bears that are doing this. It's simply a bear being a bear and taking advantage of what's available. So this is our current bear range in Massachusetts. All of the, well, I should say historically, we had black bears all the way to the coast. Uh, this was in pre-European uh, colonization times. Um, when Massachusetts was almost 100% forested. When European colonists came, they cut down the forest and turned it into farmland, so the loss of habitat. And as well, animals were hunted in an unregulated fashion. Fish and wildlife agencies obviously didn't exist at that time, so animals could be hunted year round. And for bears, they were hunted for food, their fur, for their fat, uh, as well as pests, predators, um, and threats, potential threats to people. And so that bear population that once existed all the way to the state ended up being just a small remnant population in the northern Berkshires. And the population that we have now is the slow expansion and growth of that population over time as forests have grown back, our agency came to being and we regulated hunting. We still have a hunting season in Massachusetts, but it's controlled as to when it happens um, and in the number of animals that can be taken and it's allowed the growth of the population. And our population is continuing to grow. Uh, everywhere in the gray blue we have here are places where we have established males and females. So there's active reproduction, there's cubs being produced here. Um, this brown area is kind of our expanding range. In, in that area, it's predominantly males that are dispersing from their, their mother's range, trying to find a territory for their own. Um, but we are in recent years getting more and more reports of females with cubs in some of these areas. So that progression to the east is still continuing. One of the best ways to, to see the growth of the bear population over time is to look at where bears have been taken in our hunting season. If we go back to 1980, there were only 10 bears taken in the entire state in the hunting season, all around that remnant population in Northern Berkshires. 10 years later, as our population had grown, it's expanded throughout most of the Northern Berkshires. Bears have now crossed the Mass Pike and are probably entering into Connecticut. 
across the Connecticut River and moving into the east. And you can see over time, as more bears are being taken, the distribution of where bears are being taken is increasing. And you're now taking five, six bears in individual towns. We've already taken our first bear east of the Connecticut River at this point, and now it's expanding further into the east. So what was happening 30 years before in Western Mass is now starting to happen in central Massachusetts as well. What we see in 2016 is that there's a very high number of bears being taken along the Connecticut border, 14, 17, 10, 9 in individual towns. Remember, bears from Massachusetts colonized Connecticut about 35 years before this, 30, 35 years before this, they don't have a hunting season. So their population has grown unchecked since then. And there's now very high densities of bears in Connecticut. And now we're starting to see kind of a surplus of bears along our Connecticut border, along the Connecticut border as a result of that. Another thing that they're seeing in Connecticut um, is that they're experiencing a lot of more severe conflict than what we see in Massachusetts. Um, a couple of years ago, they had over 40 home entries by bears um, in, in the state whereas we have no more than two or three per year in all of Massachusetts. So real differences based on how bears are being managed in the state. But you see this continued progression of where bears are and now the increase in the number of bears east of the river. And so this is now in our modern hunting framework uh, where we've had taken. And so you can see this shows the relative longevity of when we've had bears in the state and so, and also the higher densities west of the river. Um, but we're now starting to get bears and more bears in central Massachusetts and, and reached a point where the population started to increase much more rapidly in central Mass as well. This is the bear number of bears taken in the hunting season over the years. Um, this generally tracks the increase in bears throughout the state. There are differences in the length in the season over time. We've increased the length in the season over time as the bear population has grown. So it's not a perfect relationship, but this shows the trend of increase in the population. And now we're seeing that same pattern east of the Connecticut rivers. We're just at a lag of about 20 or 30 years behind where it is west of the Connecticut river. So that's one way we have an idea of what's happening with the number of bears and where they're found in Massachusetts. Another way is looking at where calls come in to either us or to the environmental police. Um, every single call to the environmental police is recorded. And so this gives a good distribution of where calls are coming from, but also it, it doesn't necessarily mean give any information as to the rel rel relative number of bears in an area. So for example, there was one bear that was being a nuisance bear in Fitchburg a couple of years ago, was approaching people and really causing issues and a number of calls came into them uh, as a result. So these are different ways we can track um, what's happening with the population and, and come up with what's going on with our bear range. But we wanna have more information in, in terms of how we manage our population. And so as a biologist, if I know the population size at one period in time, I wanna predict what the population is gonna be in the future. In order to do that, I need lots of pieces of information as all these things are pieces of information that I need. So I need information on how many cubs there are now, how many yearlings there are now, juveniles, adults, females and males, what's their survival rates to the next year? So how many would that produce? How many cubs are they gonna produce? And if I have all these pieces of information, I can get an idea of what the population is gonna be in the future. But we have to try to get this information in order to do this. And to do this, Mass Wildlife, along with uh, researchers at UMass have been collaring and tracking black bears in the state since the 1980s. It's one of the longest term studies uh, anywhere in the country. Uh, and as I said, the main me means of us getting this information is by putting tracking collars on bears uh, and then monitoring their survival and cub production over time. Every year we trap new bears. And so we're doing that this time of year. Um, and we use these barrel traps to do so. So this is two and a half 55 gallon drums welded together. There's a bait bag in the far end of the trap. Um, the bear crawls in and even this big bear will squeeze himself into that trap. Uh, they pull the bait bag and the door closes behind them. And now we can, when we check the bear, the trap the next day, we'll have this bear inside. So we can then apply a tranquilizer with, with the door closed and then pull out the bear. Um, and that's how we now have a new bear that we can add into our study. On the right, you can also see occasionally we take advantage of when a bear is um, a, a female with cubs happens to be in a tree in a more developed area. Um, that's actually how we got one of our collared bears in, um, in Amherst a, a number of years ago now. Um, and so that's how we can we can take advantage of and get bears collared in places we might not trap otherwise. 
Once the bear is tranquilized, we pull it out of the trap and we can begin to work it up. All the bears get ear tags with a unique number. Um, so that way, if they're taken in the hunting season, they're involved in a vehicle collision. Um, a bear leaves Massachusetts and goes up to New Hampshire and is involved in a vehicle collision. We'll have that information on what the origin of that bear is. And all of our females now are getting tracking collars. Uh, so these collars allow us to monitor her survival from the time she's trapped until the next time we handle her in the den that winter. And most of our collars now are equipped with uh, GPS units. And so basically they take a GPS fix every 45 minutes. So we get really detailed information on what these bears are doing, what habitats they're using, how often they're close to houses, where they're crossing roads and moving across the landscape, um, pretty much uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So as I said, those collared bears, and right now we have 34 collared females. Uh, we track them to their dens each winter um, and to, to assess the, their cub production. And so here's a variety of different den types that are common in Massachusetts. In the upper left, you can see a rock cave. This actually isn't very common because it's not something that's readily available to bears really in most places. But often there can be a hollow up in a tree or at the base of a tree they'll den in uh, next to or underneath um, the root mass from overturned trees or just in dense briar and brush or a log pile or in a burrow in the ground underneath a log or underneath a stump. Um, and so we really like these burrow dens because there's a really good chance we're going to capture the bear. As I mentioned before, um, they're just sleeping. So if we were and we're going to do this capture work, we're talking and breaking sticks and things as we're going in, uh, the bear's going to wake up and she's going to run off and it kind of ruins our opportunity to, to do the work we need to. So we sneak in as quietly as we can and we try to apply the tranquilizer with a, uh, from a syringe on the end of a long pole. She goes to sleep right in the den uh, and then we can work her up. We pull her out at that point, we assess her condition, um, refit or replace her collar as needed, um, and just record biological information. Half of our females every year are pregnant. And so once she's immobilized, the, the cub, these cubs are small enough that they can be handled um, awake. And so we determine how many cubs she gave birth to, what the sex of the cubs is. Uh, we weigh the cubs and set, uh, assess their condition. And so there's one of those pieces of information we got to model the population is, um, is how many cubs she produces. Once we've done all the handling we need to, we put mom back in the den. Um, we tuck the cubs right in next to her. We cover some brush over them. You can see these pine boughs behind this person. Those are gonna go over the opening in the den. Um, she wakes up, recovers from the tranquilizer right in the den um, and keeps taking care of the cubs. They stay in the den for another month or so before emerging and, and not really knowing anything happened. We'll track that female and those cubs throughout the next year. If she were to, to die through in that period, well, that's a piece of information. What was the cause of her mortality? Um, if not, we'll attempt to capture her again the following winter. If we can successfully immobilize her, then one at a time we can uh, immobilize those one-year-old cubs. They're gonna be anywhere from 40 to 100 or more pounds, um, depending on where they live. You know, It's gonna be a 40 pound bear, 50 pound bear in a more forested natural area, 70, 80, 100 pounds in a suburban or urban area. All those, those cubs get uh, ear tags, just like mom. And then you can see in the lower right, uh, the young female gets an expandable collar. Um, this allows us, the, the expandable collar allow, accommodates her growth over the next year. She'll then by herself the next winter, she'll get a full-size collar at that point, and we'll be able to track her survival as a one-year-old, um, her survival moving forward for her entire life. When does she have her first cubs? How many cubs does she have throughout her life? So by doing this work, we can get lots of information and a really complete picture as to what's happening with our bear population. Here's an example of a family of bears that we collared and, and handled uh, one year. So this is the, the, the mom. She happens to be a four-year-old female um, at this point. This is her first litter, and she actually successfully um, raised her first litter, a male and a female. The male has ear tags, as you see, and the female got an expandable collar. We just handled that, um, the female, this by herself for the first time this winter, and she denned right next to the Worcester Airport. So um, she's now got a satellite tracking collar on her, and it'll be interesting to see uh, her interaction with Worcester and some of its suburbs in, in the coming years. 
And by doing this study over a very long period of time, we have a lot of information on um, survival rates for bears and their causes of mortality. So we know that the adult female survival rate is very high. And this is the number one factor that's going to determine whether, whether you have an increasing population, as we do, um, you have a stable population or a decreasing population. We have information on age of first reproduction. And so historically, we would have said that it's three or four um, in earlier and developed areas. Now, almost every single one of our bears, and granted, we have more bears collared in suburban areas than in rural areas. Um, they're all, almost giving birth at three. It's very rare that we don't have one giving birth at three years old. We have information on that first litter size, typically one or two cubs, small cubs, versus two, three, or four, typically two to three, um, larger cubs for a more mature female. And cub survival. Cub survival for that first litter is much lower than subsequent litters. Um, the moms don't have the good enough body condition, so they lose their milk supply halfway through the year. Um, they move around too much uh, at a, when the cubs are still very small, um, taxing the cubs. They don't know how to fend off males in the mating season. They just they don't know how to be good mothers yet. So often they'll lose that first litter. Often they'll be bred again that year, and they'll have cubs again as a four-year-old. And pretty much every other year, with years where randomly they, they lose cubs as well, um, they're going to produce a litter every other year um, for the rest of their life until they get into their upper teens and 20s. Um, and then the cub production is going to decline where they have fewer cubs and eventually uh, no cubs. And we've learned about, a lot about causes of mortality. We know that there's very little natural mortality in our bear population. Uh, it's almost all human associated. So it's either from our hunting season, uh, vehicle collisions, or nuisance kills um, by the public. And through this, with all this information over time, we've been able to project the growth from a, an early study where they determined a population estimate in the late 80s and early 90s. And we've projected the growth of our population off of that. Our survival rates are consistent, cub production is consistent, and that would mean we'd have a very high uh, population at this point. That's not really probably realistic. We estimate we still probably have around four or 5,000 bears. Um, but what we do know is that we do have these, the, the demographic rates, so the survival rates, the birth rates, et cetera, um, are consistent with what they've been historically that is allowed for the growth of the population. So we're still very highly confident um, that we have a healthy growing population still uh, in Massachusetts. So I mentioned that we are now tracking bears with, with GPS collars. So this, obviously, you guys are all familiar with this area. Um, here's home right here for you. Um, the Quabbin, the Holyoke Range, Northampton there. I'm going to put GPS data from our collared bears on here. This figure actually is several years old. So your bear actually doesn't show up on here. There's a bunch of other new bears that we have using the area that don't show up on here. Each one of the clusters of uh, dots of one color are an individual bear. Um, this is only females. There's no males in here. There's no cubs, anything. But this will give you an idea of what it means to have bears living amongst you because they're kind of everywhere. Uh, as I said, if your bear was here, basically this whole area would be covered as well. Um, there are other bears living here. We just don't have the data for them at this time um, to show this. So this means that bears are in neighborhoods. They're next to schools, next to playgrounds on a daily basis uh, in, in your area and in Massachusetts as a whole. And as a manager, we can accept this um, while it's not an ideal situation. We can accept it because the black bears aren't inherently aggressive um, towards people. And this isn't unique to, um, to Amherst, what you're dealing with. So this is just south of you. So this is the Holyoke Range, uh, Westover Air Force Base. So this is uh, Chicopee, uh, Holyoke here. And this bear went down Holyoke and into West Springfield. Uh, this bear regularly crosses the, the Mass Pike in Ludlow. And so same thing happening there. And finally, this is your bear. Um, so this isn't a complete data set for your bear. Unfortunately, there have been collar issues with, with her. Um, she has a good collar on her now. We're going to get good data up from her, but um, it, uh, we didn't handle her this winter. So I wasn't able to download the data from, from last year. But this shows you, you know, she's active around UMass campus. She goes up into Leverett. Uh, just this past week, she went down south along the Holyoke Range, along the Fort River, and over on Mount Warner. So using this, this whole area, but right in and amongst town, as you see here as well, and obviously are well aware of. So 
Why are bears so close to us? It's because this sort of habitat configuration is extremely common in Massachusetts. We've got very good wetland protection laws. So there's buffers around wetlands. Um, there's forest blocks. So there are neighborhoods and developments that intersperse with this natural habitat. So what we're doing tonight and what my job is as the bear manager is try to get people who are living in these neighborhoods and they're thinking this, they're thinking backyard picnic, taking the kids to soccer practice or what have you, but that the decisions that you make around your individual homes, your neighborhoods, your communities also determines how much it's this as well. Um, this isn't your bears. This is actually happens to be another collared female with three yearling cubs uh, in Northampton from about a decade ago. My goal as the bear manager for Massachusetts is to have a healthy bear population feeding on natural foods and using natural areas and living compatibly uh, with the human population. But there's only so much I can do to achieve that on my own. I really do need your help as individuals and communities to, to achieve these goals. I talked about before why bears hibernate. Um, in, in kind of what the nature of a bear is, they hibernate because there's no food available for them in winter. And so this means they're evolutionarily adapted to try to eat as much food as possible in the seven or eight months that they're active. Um, this is just what a bear is. It's, it's kind of an eating machine. They'll eat anything and they have this compulsion to try to eat. Um, this means that bears are gonna take advantage of human associated foods year round. Uh, and this is the driver of human bear conflict. It's not because these are bad bears, they're just taking advantage of these resources that we provide for them. So bears and bird feeders, obviously this is something that has come up in town. Um, I'll get rid of a misnomer right away. There's no such thing as a bird feeder. Uh, these are wildlife feeders. Um, people who are putting out bird feeders are putting out food for that attracts wildlife. And every one of you who does it, you know this because you've got squirrels and chipmunks that you probably curse on a daily basis coming to your backyard as well, but they do attract bears. They attract predators who try to come and prey on those birds and squirrels and chipmunks in your backyards. Um, but for bears, this is really the dr main driver of uh, human wildlife conflict with bears um, because it's, it's the bird feeders that are really drawing bears to backyards and training them that the best place to find food um, is on, in your backyards, on your decks. I circle this female. This You can just see the collar underneath her chin here. Uh, this is one of the females that we collared um, with her mother. As soon as mom used the Holyoke Range and down into South Hadley, the north parts of South Hadley and Granby. Um, and that's what she showed this cub to, to use when she was young. As soon as she dispersed, she moved down into the flats of South Hadley, Granby and down into Chicopee. She was one of those bears in that figure I showed you before. Uh, she's habitually in backyards and she's become a, a renowned uh, chicken coop raider um, in, in those areas as well. So this is how it can progress from a cub to an older bear as they learn these behaviors at a young age. Uh, this photo, I actually stole this photo and caption from our old Connecticut River Valley uh, district manager uh, from a talk that he had, but I've had this conversation with people many times. Dave, you've got to come and do something about the bear that's on my back that keeps coming to my backyard. And you know, do you have a bird feeder? Yes, I do. Well, there's not really anything I can do as long as that bird feeder remains. Um, that bear is going to keep coming back and back. They're like, well, relocate the bear. Okay, where do you want me to take it? Take it to Quabbin. Um, if you look at many of these bears, Amherst and Quabbin are probably both part of their home range. So we take it to Quabbin, even if it's out of their home range, more often than not, they come back in a very short period of time. We moved a bear out of Northampton. It was actually denning underneath uh, a deck at a condo uh, complex. And the woman there was actually dealing with cancer. So we wanted to get her and her two over hundred pound yearlings out of there. We moved them up to Conway State Forest, which is 15 miles away. Uh, they were back a day and a half later underneath the same deck. So moving these bears doesn't resolve it. And if you determine that this is a conflict bear, we can't move that bear somewhere else in Massachusetts because believe it or not, there are people that live around the Quabbin and the bear's just gonna cause conflict for them. So do I shoot this bear? I don't believe anyone here wants me to shoot this bear. I don't wanna shoot this bear. And if I did shoot this bear, it wouldn't solve the problem either. You saw how many bears are living in and amongst you. And so removing this bear doesn't do anything as long as that bird feeder remains, other bears are gonna do the same exact thing that this bear did uh, as long as that remains. 
Unfortunately, each time they get these food rewards, they're learning, they're being trained that the best place to find food is around our homes, neighborhoods, and decks. They learn these locations, they turn time and time and time again. Even if it's not the same location, they've got a search image that's deck. I'm gonna check it for food. Even that, So that's where someone who doesn't have bird feeders out may still have bears checking out their decks and things because they're so often coming to decks for those. And they won't remove, they won't end, as I said, if the bird feeders aren't removed. So in terms of bear management, there's no question that bears and bird feeders aren't compatible. They're just not, they, they draw bears into our backyards and neighborhoods. Another big issue is bears and garbage, um, a lesser extent, but it certainly is a big issue and can be a big issue in places. Um, so we, we encourage everyone to store their garbage in a secure building, a garage, a shed, put it out the morning of pickup, not the day or night before, put it out the curb in a can, not just a trash bag, if at all possible. Um, and if you don't have a shed or a garage or something, we have plans to build these little garbage can storage sheds, if you will. They were put together by Florida Fish and Wildlife. Um, their bear, they have a lot of issues with their bears with garbage uh, because of tourists and things. And so they put together extremely detailed plans um, it tells you exactly how many bores, how you have to cut them, put them together. So even if you're not a handy person, uh, you could put together one of these sheds and we have them available as PDFs in our offices um, if you wanted them. Dumpsters are potentially a, a pretty major issue. Um, and these can be from restaurants, apartment complexes, retirement homes, uh, trailer or RV parks, summer camps and campgrounds. Typically uh, that happens a lot in the Berkshires. So anywhere where you have a group of people that are using a dumpster, this can cause a potentially dangerous situation with bears. Uh, if bears are regularly accessing the garbage on a regular basis, this has the potential to put people and bears in direct contact. If someone's going to that dumpster at nine o'clock at night and there's a bear in it, all of a sudden you're this close to the bear. The bear reacts defensively and it takes a swat at someone. That's how someone gets injured by a black bear, even if they're not aggressive. The bear's not being aggressive, it's all of a sudden you're right there, it gets spooked, it reacts. So dumpsters can be a potentially dangerous situation. So um, bears can cave in the, the top of plastic top dumpsters. Um, so we encourage anywhere, if you have a place that is having issues with bears or other wildlife for that matter, getting into dumpsters to request a metal top dumpster from your waste disposal company. They will provide them. Sometimes there is an additional cost um, and sometimes they grumble about it, but they will provide them. But it's also important to make sure the doors are closed, that they're latched so that the bear bears can slide them open if they're not latched, um, that they're not overflowing. So if they're overflowing, get a second dumpster or have them emptied more often. Um, but we have had many places where they've had major issues with bears in their dumpster. They get a metal top dumpster and those problems disappear. These food sources are the reason that that bears in the backyard. Um, if they, they're not there, there's no reason for that bear to be there. So if we remove the food sources, that bear is going to go back to natural areas and feeding on natural foods. As I mentioned with that young collared female that we have, those females um, teach those cubs the same behaviors from day one. Where do you think when these cubs disperse in a year that you see in the picture, they're going to go? Are they going to go now searching for food in the natural area? Or are they going to be in the suburbs? So those three cubs for, with your bear from last winter, they're dispersing now, but they've learned these same behaviors. So they're probably going to do those same things. Unfortunately, the more time they spend there, the more comfortable they get. They can get bolder, where all of a sudden they're trying to break into a shed or a garage to access bird seed or garbage that's stored there. For some reason, people store bird seed on screen porches and things. And so now, the, obviously, that provides no resistance to a bear. They can smell it. Um, so that's now blurring the lines between a bear breaking into a home. Um, so this is how these behaviors can progress. Or now, as I'll get into in a second, they start um, raiding chickens uh, as they're encountering chicken coops in backyards. And so the more time people, the bears spend around people, the greater the chances there are of a chance negative encounter. We're fortunate in Massachusetts that we've never had anyone seriously injured by a black bear. Uh, this is despite the very high le heavy levels of interaction that we see on a daily basis, but we're trying to prevent that from happening. And so, you know, the more time they spend around our neighborhoods, the greater the chances there are that that could happen. Bears and chickens are becoming one of the, bears and chickens really, chickens are the biggest source of conflict with bears right now in Massachusetts. Um, like I said, as they're in backyards, backyard chicken farming has become exceptionally popular. 
I'm sure that this figure grossly underestimates the number of backyard chickens there are around in the area. And if you remember this, that means as the bears are using these areas, they're encountering this. And you can't build a chicken coop or a beehive that can withstand a bear. They doesn't matter how well you think you built it, even a young bear can tear into it. Um, and so we're really trying to encourage everyone who participates in these activities uh, to use electric fencing. Um, well-built electric fencing, um, it works. It's safe around kids and pets. Um, they cannot get electrocuted by it. They cannot get seriously injured by it if it's properly installed um, and it is infective. Whoops, I'm not sure what happened there. Give me a, bear with me. We jumped to the end here. Um, but remember, your goal is to build an electric fence that is actually going to keep a bear out. So build a good one and design one that will actually achieve that goal. A couple of years ago, I put together a complete electric fencing guide. It provides the materials, our recommendations for how to set one up, step-by-step uh, -step instructions, tips as how to make it more effective. It's available on our bear page, mass.gov forward slash bears, electric fencing guide as a PDF. Um, all the materials are available at any farm supply store. So really, if you have chickens or bees or you know anyone who does, please encourage them to use electric fencing. There's a lot of other, other information on our website. Most of it is similar to what you're hearing tonight um, about trying to prevent conflict, not feeding bears, um, but it's available at mass.gov forward slash bears. Again, human associated foods are the main driver of bear conflict. Um, these are just bears that are taking advantage of the foods we provide and they're never gonna change. It's just a bear being a bear. And so really people have to change uh, if we don't want these bears to be in our neighborhoods or we don't want to have experienced the conflict with them. Remember, these are our goals to have healthy wildlife populations, healthy bear populations living in our natural areas in Massachusetts. And it's kind of up to individuals and communities as to uh, as much as me as to how much we can achieve that. Um, again, there's our website, mass.gov forward slash bears. If you're ever having an issue with bears and you need assistance, um, the environmental police are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week at that number. Our regional office is in Belchertown. The biologist there, Dave Fuller, uh, has an incredible amount of um, bear experience. He did that original population study in the late 80s and early 90s and has worked with bears for us ever since. So a huge resource in your area. I'm out of our Westboro office and, and I'm always happy to help as well. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to uh, take any questions that you have. That was excellent information and I so enjoyed all of the photos. I am going to look at the attendee room, Dave, and let you get a sip of water and we will take questions as I see them appear. Okay. Um, attendees, raise your hands, please, and I will call on you one at a time. Again, we have Dave here from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and we also have Carol here, who is our local animal control officer. And I'm calling on Ira Brick, because you popped up first. Ira, please unmute and ask your question. That was a great talk. Thank you so much. I'm wondering what you can say about compost piles. Um, we don't typically get many reports of bears getting into compost. Um, I think when I, to be honest, I recall a single report and it was that person admitted to putting uh, meat scraps in it. So I would highly recommend not putting any meat scraps into it. Um, but otherwise we don't get a lot of reports. If you are experiencing issues, you can try to get one of those contained units, those drums that will keep it in, you know, something to keep it more contained and protected but we don't tend to hear a lot about it. Thank you, Dave. And now, um, Linda, do you have a question for us? Yes, I submitted a, um, a question <laughs> earlier. Dave, I have um, vinegar bottles hanging from my bird feeders. I do take my bird feeders and the vinegar bottles in at night. And this tip was given to me by a friend in Hatfield who hangs vinegar bottles under his bird feeders. Um, we had a young bear here earlier this week and uh, I was gone today. Somebody took down my suet feeder this afternoon, broke the, um, the chain that holds it up, which is pretty flimsy, but I don't think a squirrel would take it down. 
but <clears throat> took down the vinegar feeder along the vinegar bottle along with it, never touched the suet, never touched any of the other three feeders that I have and took off. Does, does white vinegar actually repel bears? We've only had one bear in our backyard, actually two in the last three years since I started hanging the vinegar bottles <clears throat> underneath each feeder. I don't know, to be honest with you. Um, you know, it, it's probably one of those where it, it may work sometimes. You know, what could have happened possibly is that the bear broke it off, the vinegar splashes out, there's then that smell, and it did startle us off in this instance. Um, I would say that it probably won't work in all circumstances and situations. Um, it, it's possible that it, it may have some effectiveness, but I, I doubt it would be 100% effective, but you know, it, it may help. It, you mentioned taking your bird feeders in at night. Our data shows that the majority of our bears are active as much during the day as they are at night. Um, so, I, and I hear that quite often that people will say, it's like, oh, I only put them out in the day and take them in at night. That may do something, but you know, many of our bears, you saw all the, the pictures there of bears at bird feeders in the middle of the day. Uh, bears active in the day and how many times people saw those your amber bears active so again probably better than having them out 24 7 but it, it's it's not uh not as good as, as having them removed but i unfortunately i can't say you know definitively if the the vinegar thing is going to be a, a cure-all for it Trevor, it's your turn to ask a question Actually, can I, can I just say one thing, you know, so it, say you try the, the vinegar thing or, you know, say you have your bird feeders out in winter, you know, you put them out in, in winter and then you have a bear come through, take them in, you know, remove them at that point and, and don't put them back out. So the bear's not coming back again and again. So, you know, you can potentially try these things, but if you are having a bear come in, uh, remove the bird feeders. So Trevor, it's your turn to ask a question. Hi, this is actually Martha and I'm in Amherst. I'm curious what you can tell us about the male who is going to be looking to mate with the female who's been in our neighborhood. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, we don't we don't typically collar males. Uh, we have occasionally in the past, but um, with the female, their skull is larger than their neck. And so you can put the collar on and it won't slip off. Uh, with the males, their neck is, is so big that a lot of times if you get a collar on them, they just slide it off pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> you certainly can't collar a, a young male because they grow so fast and they grow so large that it just wouldn't be humane to put a collar on a, a, a young male in that way. Um, so I, I don't know who's going to mate with her. Um, we did put some GPS collars on some very large males that we trapped in the Quabbin. Uh, kind of in Pelham, so uh, probably in gates 12 to gate eight was where we had these traps. Um, and one bear, one of the males went across Amherst, swam across the Connecticut River over to Northampton and back. Um, one would run the entire Prescott Peninsula of uh, the Quabbin, go down, go into South Hadley, run around South Hadley, go back, run the peninsula again, and did that multiple times during the mating season. Another one swam from the Quabbin Visitor Center to the south end of the Prescott Peninsula and did that seven or eight times in the mating season. So males could cover extremely large distances in the mating season. So you could have a male that's coming from, from South Hadley, from, from where, from Orange, coming down and, and interacting with and mating with the female in your area. And the cubs that are here in Amherst, what would you expect that they will do? Are they, are they males or females, the cubs here? Yep, so she gave birth to four cubs. Um, she was actually denned on the UMass campus and gave birth to four cubs, not this past winter, but the winter before. Um, three of those were females and one was a male. Um, so she lost one of the cubs somewhere along the way. Um, and we, we didn't handle them because they were active all winter. We did not handle them, so I don't know. Uh, but it's either three females or two females and a male. When the, the cubs disperse, typically the males disperse very widely. So that male could end up in New Hampshire, over by Worcester, could cross the Connecticut River, could go down to Connecticut, very long distance away. 
typically the females will occupy a portion of their mother's range. So mom may shift her range slightly to accommodate it, or she'll kind of just use the periphery of mom's range. And that kind of provides an advantage for her and for mom to pass her genes on because that cub knows, knows the landscape there, knows where to find food. And so she's more likely to be successful raising her own cubs and therefore passing on mom's genes in the future. So I would anticipate that at least two of those cubs will be somewhere in, in the area and using some portion of her range. Elaine, it's your turn to ask your question. Uh, hi there. Um, so re two weeks ago, we had uh, two cubs and a, a mom on our deck, kind of just checking things out and they left. My, my husband was taking a video of it. Um, and then a week after in the morning, I noticed what might have been a mom or I, I don't really know. So my question is, um, will it be safe to put out hummingbird feeders in a few weeks or are we like on the grocery store route for these these bears? We're in Amherst, in Amherst yep. Woods. <laughs> so we do have, did, did that female have a collar by any chance? You still there? Sorry, sorry. Yeah, it, it, I got muted. Um, so I didn't notice because it was too far away and it was nighttime when, when uh, my husband took the video. But um, yeah, I, I would say no, but I don't know. Okay. So we did, we do have a... Um, <clears throat> So the first female, that female that I hinted that we um, had captured in Amherst when she was active downtown, um, she's now, she slipped her collar in 2017 um, and we had GPS data. On, and she, part of her range was Amherst Woods. Um, we, she was already an old bear. She was in her upper teens at that point, And we kind of thought that likely she had died. Last summer, we had a picture of a female with ear tags that looked like a very old female in Amherst Woods with, with cubs. So it's possible that it's it's that bear who is a quite who would easily be over 20 years old. We have another bear that we just trapped um, right on the Pel Amherst Pelham line this past summer, um, who is using Amherst Woods now. So we just started to get GPS data from her, and part of her range is Amherst Woods. So it's possible that it's her. She did have two two cubs this winter, uh, newborn cubs. Um, so certainly Amherst Woods there. You're right next to Lawrence Swamp. You're right across from Pelham Hill. So there's lots of natural habitat. There are lots of bears there. Um, we don't tend to get as many reports about hummingbird feeders. So it, they would be definitely the, the by far the lesser of the two evils. Um, I will be honest with you. My <laughs> wife puts out hummingbird feeders. So uh, I do not have any bird feeders, but we do have hummingbird feeders. I would say the same thing that I say with bird feeders. Um, if you, if all of a sudden the bear is coming to them, um, take them in and don't put them back out. Thank you. Catherine, it's your turn to ask your question. Yes, I was wondering, I enjoy hiking at Quabbin and a lot of people get freaked out that I don't carry bear spray with me. I try to be just conscientious about not getting any near bears if I see them. I was wondering what your opinion on that was. Um, so there are people hiking in Massachusetts on a daily basis. Um, who don't carry bear spray. You know, I, I'd say the people that carry bear spray are in the vast min minority. Um, and again, you know, you're, you're not dealing with an aggressive, an aggressive animal. So that you're talk about being aware of your surroundings. Uh, if you do see a bear, giving it the respect it deserves and not trying to get closer to take a, a better photo or anything like that. You know, typically we say if you're hiking and you encounter a bear, it's good to let it know that you're there so you don't get closer and surprise it. So, you know, start talking to it, raise your, your arms so you look bigger and just not yelling or screaming at it, but in a calm, assertive voice, hey, Mr. Bear, I'm just over here going about my business and then slowly back up, you know, watch the bear and back up to increase the space between uh, you and the bear and enjoy the sighting, quite frankly, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's a great thing to, to see them out there. Um, if you were ever hiking and you were pursued by a bear, on very, very rare occasions, black bears can be predatory towards people. Um, there was a hiker in New Jersey who was killed um, probably five or six years ago now. Um, and so if you were pursued, like you, you, you do what I said and you back off and the bear comes and then you move further off and you start, you know, hiking more quickly down the trail and the bear's coming. You, you want to get out of there at that point um, and, and not stick around. Uh, but again, that, that is, you know, really 
very rare that 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 occurs. But if you wanted to carry bear spray, you certainly can. Um, and might as well talk about bear spray um, here for everyone else. If you're not aware what it is, um, basically it is pepper spray. Uh, it's designed to repel brown bears for uh, a much larger and far more aggressive bear for people yeah. in Alaska, Canada, the Rocky Mountains, uh, yeah. where those animals exist. Yeah. Um, and basically it puts out a cloud of pepper spray out to about 20, 30 or 30 feet. And so you can wear it kind of in a little holster on, on your uh, on your belt. If you encounter a bear at close range, you spray that in front of you and basically it's going to get the pepper spray in the bear's eye and it's designed for the bear to run off and give you a, a time to get out of there. Um, but, you know, certainly I, I would not at all hesitate to recommend anyone hiking in the trails of Amherst, um, in the Quabbin, anywhere else in, in having any fear of having bears or black bears around. And I'm going to unmute private citizen it's your turn to ask your question yeah so if it's uh, effective uh, electrifying chicken coops uh, has anybody ever electrified a bird feeder to keep bears away from it? i would highly recommend and i would ask you not to do it um the reason being is i need the electric fencing to be effective for the chickens and beets um, so almost every single one of our bears has learned that bird feeders are a food source. And so if, so they, they know and they, they come to them. So if you put an electric fence around your bird feeder, um, the chances are that yeah, you're not going to pay attention to whether it's always effective, you know, because you do have to maintain electric fences and, and do certain things to make sure they're operating all the time. Um, and all of a sudden, if that bear comes through that electric fence, it's going to learn like, oh, I can actually get through this. It's not as much of a deterrent for the people that are using it to protect, you know, their, their livestock or whatnot that they have on their properties. So we never give that recommendation to use electric fencing for bird feeders for that reason, because we, we really want to maintain its effectiveness uh, for those that need it. Mary Anderson, it's your turn to ask your question. Okay, thanks. Uh yeah, you keep talking about the females' ranges. How territorial are these bears? Do they uh, really guard their ranges, or is it just a whatever? Oh, well, yeah. So a home range is just a term that describes basically the, the territory that an animal, typically the, the portion of the landscape that the animal uses in a typical year. Um, but no, black bears are not like a territorial animal. Like a coyote and a coyote family group will defend their territory from other coyote groups. And if they come into it, they're going to attack them and, and try to defend it. There's a lot of overlap between different bears. Um, and so, so there, there's, there's gonna be quite a lot of over, overlap. They tend to use the same range year on year for the most part. They will shift occasionally over time, uh, use new areas, whether it's because they're seeding it for females, they're seeding it to their offspring, as I mentioned. Um, but no, they're not a true territorial animal where they're, they're defending it. Thanks. Roger, it's your turn to ask a question. Hi, yes, I love having bears around, but one thing I don't know is what is the ecological benefits of having bears around? You know, in terms of uh, the, the, the benefit, it, it's not like they're a, a prey animal that's supporting other, um, other prey animals or anything like that. So it's, it's not, I get this question and I quite frankly, I have a, a difficult time answering it. Um, you know, certainly a role they play is they will serve as a scavenger. You know, they will clean up, um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, dead animals and things that are on the landscape. Um, they disperse, one thing they will do is they'll disperse berry seeds because they eat an enormous amount of berries. And so if you find bear scat um, in the late summer, it's basically packed with whether it's cherry seeds, blackberry seeds or what have you. And so as they move around, that's basically those seeds are highly fertilized and they can spread it on the landscape. So that's an ecological role that they will certainly play. Um, you know, I would just say more having them around is it sounds like you're of like mind to, to me that, you know, all of our wildlife species have have value are important to um, to have and to maintain in a complete uh, healthy ecosystem in our area. And so certainly they have that intrinsic value of, from, from that nature, if you will. Craig, it's your turn to ask your question. 
Uh, I have uh, a can of bird seed out in the garage. I have a trash Please. can left over. Sign <clears throat> off. Okay. Well, thanks for listening. I'll see Hello. Yep. Uh, so I have a can of uh, a trash can of bird seed out in the garage, left over from when I was actually hoping to uh, to set up a bird feeder again. Um, the I, a bear came by and knocked it over, but I had mixed it with cayenne pepper. Uh, my, my they didn't eat anything. Um, just spilled it into the, on the floor of the garage. But my question is, are they likely to come back again and knock it over again? It's possible. I mean, we definitely have bears that enter enter garages, as I mentioned, garages, sheds, and things to access birdseed um, on a regular basis. Um, or I don't know if it's a regular basis, but it, it certainly is something that happens. Uh, they definitely have a memory. You know, they, they know where um, where things are. In terms of like the cayenne, um, one of the ways that people misused pepper spray, bear spray, was people would buy it and then go backpacking or camping somewhere. And basically they'd spray their tent down or the area around their tent thinking that it was going to repel bears. Uh, and in reality, that ended up attracting bears because of the smell, you know, uh, and it kind of defeats the purpose of how the pepper spray is supposed to be used. Um, it's possible that the, the cayenne will you know, the bear got it and it's like, nope, I'm not going to try that again. Um, it's possible it'll come back. It, it's, it's tough to say, but they do have a memory in terms of where food sources are. Thank you. Lisa V, it's your turn to ask your question. Lisa, are you there? Yeah, I was just muted. So, okay. um, I guess my question is, what ecological role do humans play, and how do you um, how do you look at all this from a from a multi species perspective instead of from a human perspective? Yeah, I mean, as a a wildlife biologist, you know, I think anyone who gets into wildlife biology does it because they have a, an interest in in wildlife and the outdoors, and it's like we enjoy doing field work, and these are the reasons that we we get into the field and you take your classes on biology and population ecology, habitat management, all these different things. Uh, and then you get your first job and I manage people. There's not a ton of uh, wildlife management that you end up doing. It's certainly in a place like Massachusetts, that is a human dominated landscape. Um, almost every single decision that we have to make uh, regarding managing a population has to take into account people, um, whether it's management decisions or the effects of people on conservation of different species. Um, I actually took the slides out of the talk, um, but a postdoc who was working with us at UMass did a lot of analyses on the movement of our collared black, black bears in Massachusetts and how they were interacting with different natural features as well as the human landscape to move across Massachusetts. And so this can be used to inform conservation and in conservation planning to maintain connectivity for bears on the landscape. Um, but yeah, no, every single thing that we do um, takes into account um, people. And, and so obviously I, I talked in the, when I was talking about the biology, the si different sizes of urban versus rural bears. That's primarily because of the, the human associated food factor that that one group of bears gets that the other doesn't. Um, while these bears in these suburban areas are in better body condition um, because of those food sources, they may produce more and more robust cubs. There's also lots of mortality that's associated with living in those areas. Vehicle collisions, nuisance kills can be higher in these suburban areas because it's a risky environment. They're crossing roads on a regular basis. They're interacting with people. So we know that that female lost one of her cubs you know, before really even you guys were seeing her on a regular basis. We don't know exactly how that occurred, but many of you have also reported to us, um, and I've been sent video, one of those cubs has a severe limp, um, and that's likely it was involved in a vehicle collision. That's typically how uh, those limps occur, or it's possible that someone uh, shot at it. People do shoot at bears as they're feeding in their bird feeders. And so 
these are certainly different ways that the human landscape and people affect, you know, what is going to be the biology of this animal. Paige, would you like to ask your question? Yes, I have raspberry beds in my garden and I haven't had a problem with bears in 20 years. Would you suggest removing them? No, I have blueberry bushes. Um, you know, I think it's, it's one of those, if you have fruit, um, try to pick it when it's ripe, you know, as soon as it becomes ripe. Um, if there's fruit that falls on the ground, clean it up. You know, if you have a, you know, an apple tree, a crab apple tree, rather than just leaving it on the ground that animals can come, whether it's a bear, a coyote, whatnot, um, clean it up when it's fallen down. So, um, you know, just maintaining those, but, you know, you can still enjoy those, those things, certainly. You just may lose a crop, you know, a year to, uh, to the bears, but it's also, it's, it's a, that's a little different than a, than a bird feeder or something that provides kind of a, a permanent, if you will, food source that the bear knows to find, you know, pretty much every time it wanders through the neighborhood, it would have to wander through there the one time when those fruit happen to be ripe. Um, so that may happen sometime, but there's many, many years where that probably won't happen. Sarah P, it's your turn to ask your question. Hi, thanks. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is um, whether or not the hot pepper suet will be bothered by the bears. Can I use that instead? Yeah, as I mentioned before, with the person who had the bird seed, I, I don't know that to 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 be sure. Um, it may have some effect. Um, it may not. You know, again, these bears will eat dead animals. They'll eat garbage. So, <laughs> you know, they're, they're certainly willing to eat things that that we won't. The other thing is that they have a search image, right? They know what a bird feeder looks like. They know what a suet cake hanging on something looks like. So even if they, so those things can still be a draw to your yard even if they don't ultimately eat them because that's what they're looking for is those things hanging in the backyard or hanging on your deck because they're a known food source to them. Okay, and the second question I had is, as Carol knows, we have a bad problem around here with people letting their dogs off leash to run into the Mount Holyoke range. Have you had a lot of problem with dogs and bears interacting? I would say no, however, I was just forwarded an email from the environmental police about a bear dog encounter that happened in Amherst uh, yesterday. Um, so this was in South Amherst. I do not know the details of it, um, but that the dog, it sounds like, was swiped by the bear. Um, so typically, I would say that is uncommon. Um, you know, maybe I get reports of two a year uh, in the entire state. Uh, in 99.9% .9 of the time, it is the dog that is initiating um, the encounter. But this say. is one of the why you don't want to have be attracting bears to your backyard issues. Um, so this can be a place where humans and bears interact. You open the sliding glass door to open it to let your dog in the backyard. The bear who's been coming to your deck to get food, all of a sudden the bear and the dog are right there. Dog goes after the bear. Bear starts going after the dog. You go out there to try to rescue your dog, which we all do. Um, and now all of a sudden you're tangling with a bear. Um, so that's one of those situations. But no, certainly, I mean, I'm not as worried about um, bears and dogs. They're, they're not going after dogs in a predatory sense. You know, most of the time they're going to ignore the dog unless the dog goes after them. Um, I'm also responsible for managing coyotes. Um, and so coyotes are certainly, they will go after dogs, um, oh, yeah. both small dogs that they see as a potential prey item, um, but also medium and large size dogs, because as I mentioned before, they are a territorial animal. And so they perceive a medium to large size dog as an interloper in their territory, as a threat to their territory or their pups. Um, so we regularly do have uh, coyotes attacking dogs in Massachusetts. Um, in yards, but then also off leash. And so the recommendation there is to have your dog on a leash. If you're on the other end of the leash, your presence should prevent that animal from going after your dogs because there is that inherent fear of you still from that animal. If the dog is off leash and is 20, 30 feet away from you, you may as well not be there in terms of that wild animal thinking about your dog. And so there is that potential for a negative encounter there. Thank you. All right, we are moving on to Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Hi, just wondering about 
whether you recommend the make a lot of noise to get the bear out of your yard. We don't have any bird feeders, but we are on an area where we had the whole family visiting quite regularly and hanging out, kind of lying down and just, is there any way to move them along or is that just bad behavior? I typically don't recommend it because of the fact that they are such a large and powerful animal. Um, and so we've only ever had six instances where someone, a bear has made physical contact with a person that we know of in Massachusetts. And one of them was where a very large bear, presumably a, a male, was doing damage to someone's peach tree out in uh, the Berkshires. And the guy ran out there, ran up to the bear, trying to scare it off, yelling at it. But he ran up to about 30 feet. And that was close enough that the bear decided, like, nope, that's too close. The bear dropped and charged him. And so it knocked into him, knocked him down, and then left. And so bears will do what's called a bluff charge. Well, they'll kind of run up close and they'll pound their paws and make some huffing noises and things as a threat to tell you, you're too close, back off. Um, but it's not, they're not necessarily, it doesn't mean they're going to attack. I just don't, want, I don't try to put people in close proximity to a bear. Um, if it was a coyote in your backyard, I would say, physically chase it out of the yard, yell and scream, throw small objects at it and drive it out of the yard. I don't give that recommendation for a bear uh, just because of the differences in, in the potential they have. That being said, you can try it. Uh, a lot of times when people do try to scare a bear off, the bear looks at them, look, goes back to what it's doing, looks at them if they persist and it'll get up and saunter off and it's good time you know they they can be difficult to spook because they spend so much time there they're comfortable and they're just like yeah i'll, I'll move on um but they may not do it in a, in a real hurry so if you do it just don't get too close to the animal um you know do it from your deck but be close to the door to get back inside uh and you can try to scare it off from from a distance but just be ready to get back inside um in, in a real hurry if you need to Ann P, would you like to ask your question? Um, yeah, uh, thank you so much. I'm learning a lot. And I was, I'm a little confused about one thing. I don't eat meat, so I don't pee. There's no meat in my compost. And certainly the bears uh, came to, into my compost this uh this past summer and Nika actually saw them <laughs> and they did damage to the fence around it. I'm wondering, is there any time during the year, any months where I'm a little safer putting my compost out than others, other months? Yeah. I mean, so it, it's, like I said, you know, it's not common and it may just be, it's, it's when bears typically do hit compost. Um, <clears throat> it's not something that people feel the need to call us about. So we don't get the reports of it, but it is happening and I don't know about it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, certainly anytime bears are active. So, you know, as I mentioned, most of the bears are emerging sometime in late March or April, and they're not entering the dens until sometime in November or December. So that certainly is your, your active period for bears being out there. Um, you know, your midwinter months are the typical months where there are fewer or no bears on the landscape. But, you know, you obviously all experienced a situation this year where they remained active all winter. Um, typically speaking, bears are denned in the, the deeper winter months. You know, if we've got a foot of snow on the ground uh, in mid-December and it's been there for a while, most of the bears are going to be denning up at that point. <clears throat> Pam R., it's your turn and welcome. Oh. oh, this is actually Alex. Okay, Hi. Alex, go ahead, please. Hi. Um, thank you very much for taking the time to explain bears. It's been very useful. Many people grow up being afraid of bears, and they they hear stories about brown bears and and have a hard time differentiating between black bear behavior and grizzlies. So there's one. Um, one thing that people hear, and that is, don't get between a mother bear and her cubs. And um, I would, I wish I'm going to ask that you speak to that, 
and whether or not somebody is in danger if they get between a mother bear and her cubs, a black bear. Yep. Um, you know, it's certainly not a place you want to be. You know, I mean, again, they're, they're, black bears and brown bears are, are very different in their disposition. You know, brown bears are aggressive. You know, that's where you start, you hear stories about people, people being mauled in Yellowstone and those kind of things. Those are brown bears. Um, if this was a brown bear that we were dealing with, we would have taken action this past winter. It, it wouldn't have been living in town like that. Um, and so you, you, you are, there is a very, very different uh, disposition. If you find yourself between a sow and, and her cubs, uh, a mother and her cubs, get, get out of there. You know, try to back off to, to make sure that you're not there. Um, you're likely in that instance to see her starting to do some of those, those bluff behaviors where uh, either she's making, you know, quick little charges or that kind of thing and then backing off in a little charge or, you know, like they make a, a huffing sound and like pop their jaws. That's kind of their threat behavior where they're, it's not threatening violence. It's threatening like I'm uncomfortable with this situation. And so just, just make sure that if you, all right, there's cubs there and mom's over there move yourself so that she can can get out of there one of the things she's probably going to try to do right away is tell the cubs to go up a tree that's the natural defense mechanism for uh for black bears and the cubs can climb as soon as they leave the den as the the young little cubs and so she sends them up the tree if she senses senses danger and so if she does that and now she's still over there and the cubs are in a tree again back off uh, she's not going to call those cubs down and she's not going to leave until she feels comfortable doing so. So give her space, uh, go inside to, to let her do it. She'll call them down when she's comfortable and, and they'll move on. Suzanne, it's your turn to ask your question, please. I know you addressed making noises before, but um, my husband bought me an air horn because I do a lot of work. Um, on the back end of my property, um, dragging branches and different things. And I've seen bears back there, yep. but I don't want to do something that's like going to be irritating. And it, I certainly, I, when I walk back in that area, I sing or make noise, assuming that's enough to um, let them know I'm around. Um, but I just wondered if that was something I should be like carrying with me or if it's something that would just make the situation worse. Yeah. I mean, it's tough to say. I mean, if you're, if you end up find yourself where you are, you know, really close to the bear, I don't know if I would immediately blast the air horn right there because you're right. It could all of a sudden startle it and it reacts more strongly than it would if it just sees you there. But what you're doing with the, the singing or whistling or talking to yourself or that kind of thing it is perfect. Um, cause the thing you're trying not to do is to surprise them. Um, and so if they know you, that you're there, they're going to avoid you. You know, they're, they're not going to try to just, you know, come up. They know what a person is. They know the sounds that we make, et cetera. And so doing those kind of things is really your best bet to just make sure you're not startling that bear. It knows where you are, uh, and those kind of things. Um, you know, just as easily as the, um, the air horn is that pepper spray. You know, if you're doing yard work, it really does. It comes in a, a nice little holster that can go on your belt. Um, and that can be something that you have there that if you do find yourself really close to an animal, it's there and you can get it out in a real hurry. And, and that's going to be a surefire deterrent if you had it there. Um, so that could be something you carried, uh, you know, as an alternative to, to the air horn. Is that something that, um, like I've, in 20 years, I've only had my compost ripped apart once. Yep. So I, I, I think it's pretty safe to use it. And that, and that was like in early March when I think they were just starving. <laughs> um, but is that something that's quite a ways from my deck? Um, mm -hmm. if, if, if bears are coming in my yard or doing something, is, is that something I could effectively do like from my kitchen window <laughs> inside and scare them out of my yard or is that not necessary just let them pass through and you mean the air horn yeah yeah and so that, that's what i was talking about before you know so that's that's one of those things that you know if you went out if they're in the, the back portion of your yard um and someone was asking this before about you know trying to haze them out of there make noise to haze them out of there yeah 
don't go, you know, out into the back portion of the yard to, to do it. But if, you know, you go out onto your deck and they're still 50 feet away, <laughs> excuse me, okay. you can blow the air horn, yell at them from there. And then you've got the, the, the door there, you know, right behind you. If suddenly they did start coming they're they're not likely to, but you know, that's where you can say, Hey, you know, get out of here at this point, you can blow the air horn from that distance. Sir. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I think everyone who's had their hand up has asked a question. I just wanted to ask Carol, Carol, when is a good time to contact you? Like, do you need to know about every bear we see in town? When should we be notifying you? And, and how does your office work with the Commonwealth when it comes to bears in, in Amherst? Well, they can certainly call me. I would rather they call my direct line and call 911 because that, <laughs> That really is an issue with the dispatchers. They've got their hands full as it is with a lot of my other calls besides bears. Um, and we know, like Dave said, we know they're here. We know they're gonna stay here. They're gonna come back. Uh, we're gonna have to learn to coexist with them. And all those things that he discussed is, is what I've been telling people throughout my 20 something years here. Uh, but I, I still would like to be, if it's something that you feel, I don't, want, I don't want it out there never to call anybody. Because if there is something wrong, I certainly would want to know it. And then I would either call uh, Dave or, I mean, uh, Dave here, this Dave or the Dave Fuller that I've dealt with quite a few uh, other occasions in town too. So who, who, I would direct them to either this, either Dave we spoke to today or to Dave Fuller over in, uh, in Belcher Town, but uh, it's okay to call me. But please, let's let's think to call the uh, my direct line, which everybody in Massachusetts seems to have anyway. So, Paul, go ahead. I see your hand up. Yeah, just a quick question: um, ticks and bears are they carriers of ticks? Is that a common thing? They will. So when we trap them this time of year, like in the den in the winter, they're they're kind of pristine. But this time of year when we're trapping them, they will have uh, ticks. Almost everything will. Um, there, there's almost no no animals that aren't going to have be some some level of carrier for ticks. <clears throat> so Dave and Carol, I know it's getting late. Do we have time for more questions? I see some hands that are still up. I'm going to lower all the attendees hands. And then if you still have a question, please raise your hand again. And we will finish up. This has been great. I mean, I have learned so much this evening. Thank you for your time. It's been yeah. really like captivating. It's so exciting to have someone who knows so much, um, Carol and Dave, that's available to us and, th and that you that you know our territory so intimately. You know, it's great. It's been quite eye-opening. I, I really have learned so much as well. Thank you. All right, Trevor, I'm going to ask you to unmute and you can ask your question. Yeah, are there any other wild animals that we should be uh, thinking about and how we should sort of adapt our behavior to uh, accommodate? Yeah, I mean, so as I said, I, I'm responsible for, you know, most of the, the wildlife um, that you're going to have, you know, the mammals that you're going to have uh, around your property. So the raccoons, the possums, the skunks, the fox, the coyote, they, they all f fall under my management. Almost everything that I've said about bears, you can transfer to those animals. Uh, the reason that they're around your homes, neighborhoods, and town is to take advantage of the food sources. Um, all these spe species are very highly adaptable in terms of their ability to live in and amongst us. And many of those smaller species, even more so uh, than a bear can. So, you know, to not have those animals around your homes the, the key message is still to remove the food sources. Um, some of those things then change in terms of, as I, I mentioned before, with coyotes, coyotes is really are the, the, the number one one in terms of the, the other form of conflict, and that's associated with your pets. So keeping your dogs on the leash really is important with coyotes around. Um, keeping cats inside important with coyotes around. Um, those are the, the big issues there. Again, the difference between coyotes and bears, um, if you don't want the coyotes on your property, act hyper aggressive towards them. Um, there is a natural fear of people, but the more time they spend in developed areas, the more comfortable they get. And you're trying to teach them, nope, you're not welcome here. And so really physically drive, chase them off the property 
make lots of noise and really drive them off. Um, and over time, they'll get that message. They're not welcome there. So if you don't have the food that's drawing them in, you teach them they're not welcome, they're likely to spend less time around your home. But the food is really, human associated foods is the number one driver of human wildlife conflict by far um, in Massachusetts. Paul, your hands up again. Do you have another question? But you're muted, Paul. I do. Uh, so Councilor Lopes said Brett raised this issue a little bit while a little while ago. Is there something the town should be doing, Dave, about um, you know helping to ma help manage other than education of people that that you see other towns have done that's a good thing to do? Yeah. So I mean, probably the 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 biggest option that you, that you can consider. Um, is whether or not you would want to consider uh, some sort of a feeding ordinance. Um, and so they can be drafted in a way that, you know, it doesn't remove someone's ability to still feed birds or whatnot if they want to. But if it's identified that that bird feeder is drawing in animals and it's causing conflict, then they would be required to, to remove them. Um, and so certainly we'd be willing to help um, with the drafting of something if you have that. Northampton has one. I know West Springfield has one. We just helped Stockbridge. Um, they were having a lot of bear issues in towns, primarily with some people that were intentionally feeding, but with dumpsters. And so they passed an ordinance to try to address some of those issues. Um, and I've shared that that ordinance with uh, with Anika. So, you know, it is something that 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 could be an option if you wanted to consider that. Okay. Elizabeth, you have another question for us? Yes. Um, I was just curious as to what you think the carrying capacity is of our area for bears, considering we have a female that potentially just produced three new females and how are, and presumably the other bears in the area are doing similar thing. And I'm just wondering, are they just all dispersing out of the area? Or are we going to have um, you know, triple, quadruple the number of bears in Amherst. So when I was at UMass and we first started putting out GPS collars, we did a lot on the west side of the Connecticut River in Northampton, William, Williamsburg, um, up through uh, the Conway area. And then we had a bear in the Amherst area, the bear on the Holyoke Range in south and some bears out in the Worcester County. The bears west of the Connecticut River, where we have much higher bear densities, had 40 square kilometer home ranges. So really pretty small home ranges. East of the river, it was 200 square kilometers. So five times the size. And we believe that was due to the differences in bear density. So since we, we put the first GPS collar out in 2009, and so even since, and obviously not all those animals were collared right away, so it probably wasn't until 2012 that we started noticing this, um, the home ranges in your area have been shrinking. And so they're getting closer and closer to the home range size that we had west of the Connecticut River. And so basically, as the bear density is increasing, they're using smaller areas. And so there are more bears that can be supported in the area. In, we have, you know, between the Quabbin and, and Amherst, I mean, we have seven or eight females collared, um, you know, using different portions of, of the area. And so if you think half of them are pregnant every other year, they're producing 2.7 cubs, you know, it's the population density is increasing in your area. And there still is potential for it to increase where you, there are more bears uh, in the area. <clears throat> and we anticipate that that will happen. And so we come to, I think, Beth, Beth S. Hi. Hello. Um, we had a bear come through our yard about last June and broke off the top six feet of a white fur that we had that was about 13 feet tall and there were um, bear prints all around the base of the tree. And then since then, we've seen some bear prints around it occasionally. We're just wondering is, was it a bear 
marking the tree and will the bear keep coming back and trying to use it as a marking tree? If we cut the tree down, will they decide to use one of our other trees as a marking tree? I guess we're just curious what that was all about. No, I think you're exactly right. And you said it was about this time of year, so that's the, the mating season. So it was very likely that it was a male that was, they're, they're kind of aggressive. They've got a lot of hormones going on this time of year. And so breaking off the tree, we've seen that at some trap sites before where, you know, a, a good size uh, hemlock or something is, is snapped off by one of these bears. So, you know, again, that demonstrates the power that these animals have. But then those, those species like the spruce and the pines that have pitch and resin in them, the bears will rub on those to, to get their scent on it. So they're using it as a scent post for marking. Um, may come back, may not come back. You said you have seen activity near it in the past. Um, cutting it down may be enough. Uh, if you have other, other spruce there, though, there's a distinct possibility that it could pick another one to, uh, to use that for as well. But you're, you're exactly right. It probably is as a scent marking and um, kind of leaving its, its scent um, kind of behavior. So they could come back and want to use it again so we can just sort of leave it as a sacrificial tree so they don't go and destroy some other tree. Yeah, because it's it's probably not going to come through there on a you know on a regular basis to to do it either you know so it's probably not it, you know it shouldn't be this any kind of a a major draw to to your property or anything by by having it remain there but yes you may not if you don't want to have other trees damaged it might not be the worst thing to to leave it there. Okay, thanks. All right, our very final question is coming from Freddie. Freddie, it's your turn to ask your question. Well, I was kind of waiting and I wasn't going to, but I thought um, I'm, I've, I'm on Fearing Street. I've had the mother bear and cubs in the yard a couple of times, um, and that's fine. My question is about walking by myself very early in the morning down around the stadium. I used to do that, you know, it was before dawn and, and that was a wonderful time to walk. And I have to say that I have stopped doing that because as a person by myself, early in the morning, and, and there are other people sometimes there, but most of them have dogs or they have another person accompanying them. I just am not, I really don't feel comfortable about um, what would I do if I did see a bear? And yep. I know you have you have directions, and I thought, okay, do I have to get out my directions and read them to, to read the protocol, <laughs> you know? So is it is it unwise for someone at my age to be out by myself early in the morning like that? No, you're a spring chicken. You should go out and you should keep, <laughs> uh, you should keep walking. Um, no, but seriously, you know, yeah. I, I showed the data with all those points that showed how many bears there are um, using your area. There are people on the bike paths. There are people hiking the trails. There are people using that. I know exactly where you're talking about by the stadium there. Yeah. Um, there are people out there on a daily basis. There are bears out there. There are coyotes out there. There are these animals out there. Occasionally people run into them and those kind of things, but there aren't negative encounters that are occurring either. So I feel very comfortable telling you that be comfortable out there walking. Don't hesitate to walk. Um, you, you talked about, you know, I don't know whether you want to, this is something some people will do for hiking in the Rockies again with these other bears is yeah. to get little bells that you put on your your bear bells your shoes yes. or whatever exactly yeah. bear bells that just make that little bit of noise so that you know if there was a bear or something there that it can hear you and it, it knows you're coming um i also mentioned that bear spray before um you know i do get comments from people whether it's associated with bears or coyotes that they're afraid to walk their dog anymore or to go out in the forest exactly your sentiment get some of that bear spray uh, again, it's it's a really simple thing to do. Um, it slides right into a little pouch, so it's it's right there that if you should have it, um, it's easy to pull out. You literally pop a cap off, and then it's just um, so that you could carry that, and then that would be just some an insurance policy, if you will, um, should you need it. Um, so I would recommend getting something like that, and please, please don't stop doing the things you enjoy um, because of the presence of bears or other wildlife out there. 
I have to say too, I, I have a I have a compost and the bears have visited the compost, but never never done anything to it. It's been just fine. Nice. Good. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. This has been wonderful. And again, um, thank you, Carol, and thank you, Dave, and Councillor Lopes. Great idea. Um, it's really smart that we recorded this, and we'll put it up on the YouTube channel. And I encourage everybody to send in more questions if they have them, and we'll try and get them answered for you. You can send those to get involved at amherstma.gov. But um, thanks again, everyone, and have a great evening. Thank you. Good night. Many thanks. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Carol, Paul, and Andrew. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dave.